The following is a production of Texas Lutheran University. For more information, please visit tlu.edu. I want to welcome everyone to this week's uh, biology department seminar. Uh, first off, real quickly, there is a chemistry seminar right after this at 2 o'clock. Mary Rose Grant is presenting her senior, se senior seminar capstone talk, so you are invited to uh, go hear Mary after this. You're also reminded that next week is, next Friday at this time, is the Student Economic Symposium. Biology department speakers will be at 1.30 on, uh, fri on Friday afternoon here in Moody Science 101. There'll be six seniors presenting talks next week, and then the following week, on the 27th, the uh, remaining six students will be presenting their senior capstone talk here in Moody Science 101. That'll be at 1 p.m. So uh, please welcome, uh, please uh, attend these if you can. I'm pleased uh, this afternoon to introduce our uh, speaker this afternoon, Dr. Linda Sullivan. Dr. Sullivan uh, is gonna tell us a little bit about her background in a minute, but I just wanted to comment that she has an undergraduate uh, degree from the University of Oklahoma in music, a master's degree from the University of Texas in Austin in music, and then she attended uh, the uh, Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine at the University of North Texas Health Science Center in Fort Worth to earn her medical degree. She is in practice in Seguin. Uh, she's a private family practice physician here in Seguin. She holds a, a dip, uh, she has diplomate status from the American Board of Family Medicine. Uh, she's a staff physician at Guadalupe Regional Medical Center in, in town. She's the medical director for Guadalupe Valley Nursing Center, again here in Seguin. And uh, she serves yet with the University of North Texas Health Science Center as an adjunct faculty member in their rural osteopathic medical program. So that's an important outreach to uh, deal with rural areas. Finally, some of you might or might have actually have seen Dr. Sullivan. She works here on campus in the student health clinic. Uh, and so uh, she is with us once uh, a week at the health clinic. Um, today she's gonna talk about preventive medicine as the topic of her talk. Please welcome Dr. Sullivan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levinson. Um, I've gotten a really warm uh, reception here. You guys are, are very lucky, um, and I'm not just paying lip service, to have the uh, facilities and the professors that you do. Um, I, hope you, uh, I hope you appreciate that. Those of you that have been to other schools might see some difference, but um, having gone to the University of Texas where you're kind of a number, um, you guys are, are really lucky. So um, soak up everything you can from your, your professors and your time here. Um, I wanted to talk today about preventive medicine because, first of all, can you guys all hear me okay? Okay, yeah, good. Um, about preventive medicine because it's one of my passions, um, is keeping people well. Um, I thought I would start off with giving you a little bit of background about me um, and why I chose family medicine. This is my family. <laughs> They're my inspiration for what I do. Um, my daughter, uh, Alex, is in my lap. She's three. And then there's Nadia in the middle. She's my stepdaughter. She's, um, she is 12, but very much almost 13. So <laughs> we're headed in that way. Um, so why did I choose family medicine? I uh, started off in medical school thinking I wanted to be an internist. Um, I was, uh, wanted to see complicated patients, and I thought that was the way to do it. Uh, then I thought about geriatrics. I was very interested in, in caring for older adults. Um, after uh, taking care of many OB patients and delivering lots of babies in our busy OB program in Waco, I really fell in love with um, obstetrics and very seriously thought about an obstetrics uh, residency. Um, but it was really family medicine I kept coming back to because um, it incorporated all of the things that I loved. Uh, I was able to uh, see patients when they first present um, on, the, on the ground floor. And while you know, there may be a perception out there that, oh, you're just a family doctor, well, it's pretty hard when you're the first one seeing the patient and you have to pull all the pieces together and try to make a diagnosis. And so that's my, my daily challenge and, um, and my joy in my practice. Um, I also get a lot of... Um, you know, excitement out of not knowing what's going to come in the door next because it's not all sniffles. I'm here to tell you. I told my nurse today, I said, why can't we just get something normal that just presents the way it's supposed to present? That patients don't read the textbooks, unfortunately. So 
All right. So I wanted to also give you a little bit of background about today's family physician and kind of what that means. Um, I kind of lifted some of this and paraphrased it from the um, American Association of Family uh, Practitioners website, which is an excellent resource for a whole lot of uh, things, uh, not just um, about the organization, but there's uh, patient information, you can look up articles, it's all uh, free access, it's really a really good source. So today's family physician um, provides a means of entry into the healthcare system. So usually or should be the first person you see, unless of course your primary care is an internist or, or a pediatrician, of course. Um, a, a family physician delivers care which is both personal and comprehensive and is not limited by age, sex, organ system, or type of problem. And that's really where we're unique in family medicine there. It's cradle to grave. There, not anything can and does walk through my door on a daily basis. <coughs> Today's family physician delivers care which is based on knowledge of the patient in the context of the family and the community. And this is a, a, big, a big part of that. Emphasizing disease prevention and health promotion. Acts as a coordinator of health care and thus prevents fragmentation of care in both the outpatient and the inpatient settings. And this last point is um, going to become extremely important as you guys go out into the workforce and really has already become very important today. That. Um, our healthcare system as it is, is, is so expensive, it's simply not sustainable. And um, there's very real uh, threat of Medicare running out of money and not being there. One of the reasons for this is that as specialists started to evolve, people thought, well, the specialist has to be better than my family doctor, so I'm just gonna go straight to the specialist for my stomach ache. Well, to someone who, you know, who sees complicated things all day, they're gonna think about the complicated things. and so. While it's not wrong, you may go to the gastroenterologist with a stomach ache and end up with a colonoscopy and an upper GI. And uh, n not, not always is that the best first thing to do. Um, and it may have been avoided in the first place. So um, keeping healthcare costs down is one of my big challenges. Um, it's something I, I really like to do. Um, I like to be miserly if I can and not, not order labs, just to order labs. And having a medical home uh, is, a, is a really vital part of, of, that, <clears throat> um, of that strategy for helping us keep uh, healthcare costs down. So an ounce of prevention. Um, this talk is about preventive care. What that means is keeping people healthy. Um, as I think about what types of um, tests I want to run on my different populations of patients, I ask myself um, these questions. And what I want to emphasize today is the process by which I go about deciding who to screen for what, when to screen for it, um, what kind of follow-up, um, because it's not, it's not black and white by any, uh, any stretch of the imagination. It's, um, you know, there's, there's uh, social uh, aspects, there's financial aspects, um, and then you always have to think about the complications or the risks of what you're, the screening test that you're about to order because nothing in medicine is benign. Everything has a potential um, uh, risk and a potential benefit. So first I ask, what are the most common causes of morbidity and mortality? Morbidity, of course, being illness and mortality being death. Um, and at what ages are these things most likely to occur? Um, second, where can I make the biggest difference in extending the length and quality of my patients' lives? And third, as we talked about, by what process do I decide whom to screen for what and when? So, I can't talk about everything, obviously, today, so what I chose to talk mostly about is cancer, because that um, cancer screening is, is, a, is a big part of my adult practice, which is really the, the bulk of my practice. I do see, I do see kids, but I, I'm, I see a lot more adults. Um, so two of the biggest killers, cancer and tobacco, I think that's pretty obvious to most people. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, you see it and hear about it everywhere. Um, so I just pulled these numbers off the internet there. This was from 2011. About 1,500 people a day die of cancer. So you can imagine how many people are diagnosed. I didn't even pull those numbers in. Um, but this is the, this is the mortality. Um, it's a pretty staggering number. Um, I know I've seen way more cancer 
um, in private practice than I ever saw in residency. Um, you know, my, my uh, fellow residents used to laugh and call me a black cloud because I seem to attract really difficult patients and really bad stuff. Um, but I just didn't see the cancer that I'm seeing now. So I don't know if it's a regional thing, but it's, uh, it's very disturbing. Um, I have found probably eight or 10 cases of pretty advanced cancer in the past two years. Just walking in my office off the street, hadn't seen anybody else. So it's, um, it's sobering. And then tobacco, which we're not going to talk about in depth, um, because really all there is to do is quit. Um, I talk about that with my patients. Um, I corner them. I'm very aggressive. <laughs> uh, but I make them talk with me uh, about why they're still smoking uh, every time I can, every time I see them. Uh, and, and, you know, when are they ready to quit? I have a question. Making sure that they know um, that there's options. Um, there's obviously big links between these two. Um, not only lung cancer, but um, uh, prostate, breast, esophageal, oropharyngeal, bladder cancer, um, and colon cancer have all been linked to smoking. So um, it's not just uh, it's not just lung cancer. <clears throat> and then, of course, the other things that I do every day: um, we try to prevent infectious disease through immunizations um, in children and adults. Um, Coronary artery disease, um, risk factor screening is a big thing that I do. Um, with all my adult patients um, at their wellness visit, we go through and we talk about what are your risk factors. We can plug those numbers into something and uh, spit out a, a number called a Framingham score that, that helps me to decide what is their 10, 15, 20 year risk of having a coronary um, or cerebrovascular event. Um, we talk about aspirin. Aspirin is not at all cut and dried. Who gets it? How much? When? Um, we talk about weight loss, et cetera, things to minimize their, their risk factors. Um, and of course, exercise, which is the, the magic pill. Um, accidents. Uh, this is what, what kills you guys, really. Um, this is a leading cause of, of, of death among uh, children and young adults, um, also elderly folks, because they fall. So I always try to talk about seat belts and helmets and drinking and driving and all that stuff um, as, as often as I can with my younger patients. So now to kind of the meat of what we're going to talk about, cancer screening, who, when, and why. Um, <clears throat> so uh, first we ask, what is your risk? Um, we risk stratify by age by smoking status, which we've already talked about, ethnicity, um, BMI or body mass index, uh, dietary habits, family history. All of these can influence certain cancers. And interestingly, um, most cancers are, are, are um, influenced by a number of those factors. Um, <clears throat> so next we ask, what are the risks of the screening tests and do the benefits outweigh the risks? So um, we take into account their personal history. If I have a 75-year-old lady who has stage four um, uh, metastatic breast cancer and comes to me and asks me if she should have a colonoscopy, you know, I don't think it's a valuable thing for her to do. Um, of course, that's never happened, but that's just an example of, uh, you know, you, you, you take the person and their history and you weigh the risks and benefits. Um, also, comorbidities, you know. Uh, We'll take the colonoscopy example again. If you have an extremely obese patient who has breathing problems, um, are they going to handle the sedation of a colonoscopy if they've never had a surgery before and proven that they can? Um, it's not a uh, it's not a completely um, you're not completely under with a colonoscopy, but you're very sedated and can certainly have um, you can have respiratory events. Uh, so then we put this in context, and this is the tricky part. Uh, First, do no harm, which I'm sure you all have heard as part of the Hippocratic Oath that all physicians take. Um, before we do anything, we're supposed to ask ourselves, is this going to harm the patient, this treatment that I'm about to give? And most of the time it can. I mean, if you read the, the, the side effects of any drug, you know, Tylenol, you probably never want to take it if you really knew all the stuff it could cause. <clears throat> so I also wanted to kind of um, give you guys some ideas about who, who makes these rules about screening. Um, you know, before medical school, I just thought there was this big they in the sky and they made up all the rules. Well, 
it's actually not that easy. Uh, there are, um, every specialty has a college um, or a professional association or both. Um, they make their own guidelines about uh, the, the cancer screening for their organ or their, their system. Um, there's, of course, the American Cancer Society um, that has um, guidelines on all cancers. Um, the one that I use the most is called the United States um, Preventive Services Task Force. And I wanted to show you guys the website um, just because this is a, um, a tool that I use a lot uh, in my practice. Um, what, what USPSTF, that's a hard mouthful to say, what they have done is um, call together a tremendous amount of evidence. Um, you can look it up by, um, I did breast cancer here, um, but you can look it up by any, anything. It doesn't even have to be cancer. Um, and it goes through extremely rigorously and gives you grades of evidence. Um, it tells you exactly how um, they came to their decision. Um, talks about the different specialties that are involved, the target populations, um, the major outcomes. Um, what are we asking about? What are we trying to find with this test? Um, they talk about their methods, um, hand searches of published literature, um, and believe me when I say this is a staggering amount of information that they have to go through. They talk about their strategies, the study selection, um, even just as a process for, for, for research. I think this is a fascinating uh, website to explore uh, the ways um, that you can be involved in research. Um, even if you're not interested in primary research, um, pulling together other people's research is a kind of a specialty of its own almost. Um, so, you know, we're not gonna go through all this, but I just wanted to show you, I mean, this goes on and on and on. I usually scroll to the bottom here <laughs> where I find my grades of evidence um, and, um, and, and my recommendations. So, um, just FYI, that's a fun, well, I wouldn't call it fun, but it's an interesting place to go um, if you have questions about uh, disease and screening for disease. And, and there's a whole lot more information there, too. Okay. <clears throat> now, I'm going to talk about statistics for a minute, but please, I know it's Friday afternoon. Um, your professors didn't put me up to this, I promise. Um, it, and it was painful for me, because I have to tell you, statistics was just, oh, it still makes me shiver um, when I think about these words, but I forced myself to go through this for you guys because I do use this stuff on a daily basis. And I know, depending on where you're at in your, in your studies, um, you will have seen these words, maybe already know um, a lot more than I do about them, which is not hard because, um, like I said, it took me a while to grasp these concepts. Um, but what's important um, about statistics is that how do we find out what's not going to harm the patient? How do we find out what's going to give me the most bang for my buck in this test? Because as we talked about, every test has a risk and a benefit. And you really want to make sure before you do a three or $4,000 test on somebody um, with possibly some uh, you know, ill effects for them, um, including radiation, um, if it's an invasive procedure, infection, death, people die in colonoscopies, you know, not on a regular basis, but you can. You know, you can perf through the colon, become septic, and there you go. Um, not to dissuade anybody or anybody's family from getting a colonoscopy, because I'm a big fan, but um, you have to think about these things. So statistics is how we, is how we do that. <clears throat> So hopefully I'll keep you awake. This is just a few slides, I promise. Okay, so um, a real life example is the uh, fecal occult blood test. Okay, this is um, the first way that we screen for cancer is we um, did a, a rectal exam and we put a sample on a card, put a few little um, dots of uh, solution on there and get an answer. Blue means that there's blood. Um, nothing means that there's not. Um, the reason why, uh, this, this is an interesting, um, interesting example is because it helps you to see this kind of big disparity between this simple test and a colonoscopy and kind of how we go about finding out who, who, is, who would benefit most from each. Okay. So, of course, the gold standard is colonoscopy. Um, 
Colonoscopy is also used to, to um, not only to diagnose, but you can also treat um, uh, precancerous lesions with that. So first we're gonna go through um, kind of the numbers of this little pretend study. Um, so uh, there were 2,000, let's see, did I say how many? 2,030 people, okay? So all these numbers, hopefully, if I did my math right, add up to 2,030. <laughs> if I made a mistake, let me know. Um, so in 200 patients um, out of those 2,030, um, fecal occult blood test was positive, okay? After getting a colonoscopy, which everybody in this pretend study did, they first got the uh, fecal occult blood test and then the colonoscopy, the colonoscopy being the way that we truly diagnose colon cancer. Out of those people, 20 of them truly had colon cancer on colonoscopy, that was a true positive. 180 had no cancer at all, that was a false positive. Okay, so that's a pretty big number of false positives. So how does that come out in the numbers? Um, looking at the negative side, oh, by the way, this is a colon. Uh, if you've never seen a colon, that's a very bad looking colon. Um, that is a um, advanced uh, colon cancer there. This is what a colon is supposed to look like, um, nice and pink. Um, so 1830 patients, um, the FOBT was negative, so it's a big number of negatives, so that's good. Um, 1820 had no cancer, true negative. 10 had cancer in spite of a negative fecal occult blood test. So um, that is actually pretty good, uh, pretty good number as well, um, that you have a low false negative. Um, so positive predictive value is um, really not terribly useful in, in really determining um, uh, what we do with this information, but what it does tell you, what are the actual proportion of positives in the population? That's about where positive predictive value ends. So um, true positive, uh, 20, false positive, 180, you get up with, uh, come up to 10%. The negative predictive value looks a lot better. 99.5% um, because um, of that small number of false negatives, okay? There's a mistake in here somewhere in one of these slides, so I think I, think I highlighted it. It was a, a negative that should be a positive. I think we're not quite, I think we were, I think it was the one before. I think I accidentally did. Yeah, that, of course, that's negative predictive value. That should be, represents the proportion of actual negatives in the population being tested, sorry. <laughs> don't, don't use these slides to study for any tests, please. Uh, this is just, just for fun. <laughs> I don't want you guys getting answers wrong. Okay, so uh, here's, here's where this information helps us. Um, uh, sensitivity and specificity. And um, this is what I use every single day. Um, uh, specificity. Uh, gives us a number uh, of the proportion of patient, patients without the disease who actually test negative. How specific is it? Is how many truly did not have the disease? So pretty good on the fecal occult blood test, 91%. Okay, Sensitivity, not so much. Um, this is the proportion of patients with disease who test positive. Okay, So what, what the value here is, um, is uh, especially in the fecal occult blood test, um, you know, we can rule out pretty, pretty well, you know, that if you have a negative fecal occult blood test, you're probably going to be good for another year without a colonoscopy, and that's exactly how we use it in practice. So 91% of people, you know, with a negative fecal occult blood test, we can let it slide. The other reason we can let it slide without doing a colonoscopy on those folks um, is because uh, colon cancer is very slow growing. And if they, if they come back in another year and get their fecal occult blood test again, um, we got another shot at it, okay? So um, that's kind of how we use the numbers. So then I thought I would go, um, go just through some, uh, some of the guidelines uh, with you and talk about, sure I've got enough time here, okay. Um, talk about some of the specifics. Um, again, most of these come from the United States Preventive Services Task Force. Uh, um, website um, and the kind of cold recommendations from um, a number of different uh, groups of really smart people. Um, so breast cancer screening, I generally start at 40. Um, women who are 40 to 49 should discuss the option um, <coughs> of breast cancer screening to be done 
once every two years. This is new. Um, it used to be everybody every year. Um, but as we'll talk about with cervical cancer, the more information we get about um, who needs to be tested, who really ends up having the disease, um, the more these guidelines uh, can change. Um, I start younger in anybody with a family history, especially a first degree, well, I should say, particularly with a first degree relative um, with breast cancer. Your aunt, your great aunt who was 90 has breast cancer, not as big of a deal um, uh, for me as your 40 year old sister. That's a very big deal, okay? Because um, breast cancer overwhelmingly is a um, de novo cancer. It just pops up, okay? But when it is in families, it is virulent and it goes very young and it can be very aggressive. So um, we often see it in a number of female family members. Um, most of the time, if you show up and you've got breast cancer in your 30s, you're, you're gonna have a, a genetic test and your whole family's gonna get a genetic test. And so by the time you come to me, most of them already know, you know that they either have the gene or they don't. Um, but uh, it's still a good idea to ask all those questions. Um, women over 50, absolutely every single year, no matter what, I will go to your house and drag you out and get your mammogram. Um, my patients laugh at me because I'm sort of um, uh, aggressive about it. We'll, we'll call them on the phone, have you had your mammogram? Um, I also really uh, like to do a breast exam before I do a mammogram. Um, I've got a lot of particularly older patients who are really used to from their previous doctor saying, oh, I just need my order for my mammogram. No, not so much, that's not gonna happen. You're gonna come in, you're gonna get your breast exam, and I'm gonna see what's going on before I send you off to get the confirmatory test because the um, information that I get from that breast exam actually um, increases the effectiveness of that screening test, uh, the mammogram, because I can say to the radiologist, two o'clock on the left breast, I felt a, three centimeter um, mass that was non-tender and non-mobile. That's probably cancer, okay? Uh, and they can take a close look at that area. <clears throat> okay, all, and then of course all women should have clinical breast examinations annually. So when do we start them? Well, I usually start with my younger females that come in, um, wanna get on birth control or wanna want establish care, et cetera. And um, we start with a breast exam just to get in the habit of it, and also to show them how to examine their breasts at home. Um, there's been a lot of controversy about that too. Should you examine your breasts, should you not? Um, I'm still a believer. Um, if you find something, come to me. If I find it too, we'll get it taken care of. Um, I don't think it leads to more, um, some people think it leads to more unnecessary testing to have, uh, same thing goes for men with testicular exams. Um, I, don't, I don't agree. I think if you know your body, you're, you're likely to be the one to, uh, to find something first. <clears throat> Cervical cancer. So this has been a big area of change recently that is um, sort of difficult for um, folks that have been in the business for a long time to kind of get their to get used to doing. Um, for many years, we screened every female uh, from the time she was almost pubertal, you know, until they were in their 60s and 70s. Um, we got pap smears. Um, the more we learned about cervical cancer, if, that it's caused by the human papilloma virus, it's sexually transmitted. Um, there's not really a family predisposition, so if your aunt has cervical cancer, that doesn't mean you're gonna have cervical cancer necessarily. Um, she got a virus, you might get a virus, you might have it, so. Um, so but what we learned out of screening these tremendous numbers of women uh, at very young ages is that cervical cancer acts um, very differently, or I'm sorry, not cervical cancer, but pre-cervical changes, um, irregular cells, abnormal cells, act very differently in young women um, than they would in an older woman. And the reason for that is there's something called the transition zone, um, and if you take uh, anatomy, you'll probably learn about this. <clears throat> The transition zone is an area um, where the cell type changes um, from a, a, a squamous cell. Um, and, and there's um, big turnover in that area. It's right around the cervical os and that little center hole in the cervix of the donut. Um, there's tremendous amount of cell turnover, which is why it's a big spot, a hot spot for cancer. Um, if you've had biology, you know that high turnover in cells can definitely trigger, trigger cancer. Um, so 
But on the other hand, it, in young women, they tend to clear these, um, these precancerous cells pretty well on their own. So you might have a 20-year-old who has a low-level abnormal cells in her first pap smear. Um, used to be that she would get a colposcopy, which is an exam under a microscope, and usually a biopsy, which is no fun, can lead to bleeding, infection, et cetera. The biopsy would be negative, and you go on your merry way, do another one the next year. And lo and behold, she doesn't have the abnormal cells anymore. It's not because you took them away, it's because you got rid of them on her own, okay? So we don't screen anybody, or we shouldn't be screening anybody, until they're 21 with a pap smear. So ladies, if you've had a pap smear and you're not 21, you don't have to have another one until you're 21. Um, but for some reason, uh, this is really, um, this has been a hard one for folks to get through. I can't tell you how many people I see on a daily basis that say, no, I've been getting pap smears you know, every year since I was 14. You know, it, it's not necessary, okay? It does not matter when you become sexually active, okay? If you're sexually active at 14, you still get a pap smear starting at 21, okay? Unless you're having problems, okay, and, and uh, symptoms, bleeding, et cetera, um, and your doctor looks and there's obviously something wrong, of course you're going to get a pap smear. But as far as just screening, um, we start at 21. So, And then when to stop. Um, this is another point of contention. I have sweet little 80-year-old ladies who come in to me and bless their hearts have been having pap smears every single year, um, and it's just not necessary. Um, as women age, breast cancer, uh, I'm sorry, cervical cancer goes down, breast cancer goes up. I would much rather they come in for their breast exam than, than, a, than a pap smear. Um, it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, now at 30, um, if you've had three consecutive negative pap smears, you can have um, a, a pap every two to three years and you're still good. Again, uh, uh, cervical cancer is very slow growing. It, it's not, um, it, now, in most cases, of course, you're always going to hear uh, about the rare case of a very unfortunate, you know, 35-year-old woman who, who dies of advanced cervical cancer, but that hardly ever happens anymore. Um, generally, it's a very slow-growing cancer. So, um, total hysterectomy. What are you screening for? What are you papping? There's nothing to pap. I have ladies that come to me who had a hysterectomy in their 50s, and they say, yeah, I get a pap smear every year. I'm like, what are they papping? There is nothing to pap. So I, I don't understand that. Um, <laughs> and I, it, it, it's, I hate to say this, I don't want to talk about it, but it's mostly the OB-GYNs, so I don't know. Maybe they're just used to that. Um, now, you can have vulvar cancers. Um, you know, it's possible, that, or um, a, a vaginal cancer, that you could find some abnormal cells on a pap if you do that. But, those are extremely rare. Um, so, ladies also, I didn't put this on here, but in their, you know, 65, you know, we don't need to do PAPs anymore. Your, your risks are so low. Most of them are monogamous. Um, and even if they weren't, okay, they could get HPV. Are they gonna develop cervical cancer? Not likely because, again, of the kind of involution of the cervix and it becomes atrophied and et cetera. I can, yeah. Sure, yeah. So there's there's an HPV vaccine uh, right now. It's recommended for girls starting age 11 and boys at nine. I think. I think. It's hard to keep all this in my head. Um, uh, it's fairly new, um, but we do we are recommending it for um, prevention of um, of cervical cancer because it um, prevents uh, infection with the human papilloma virus. Is that an area of interest for you, or just? Well, I just think that people are still. <coughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea that men need to, or boys, yeah. need to be vaccinated is also relatively new. Absolutely. The concern there is this oral cancer. Exactly. Oral pharyngeal cancer is, is starting to really rise from HPV. Um, boys, um, uh, yeah, absolutely, um, at starting at age nine. And, okay, if you didn't have it at age nine, it's okay. You can still get it until you're 25, I think. Um, so, you know. Uh, Oh, exactly, exactly. But, you know, in talking to my parents, um, there's, you know, there's still a little concern. It's not, you know, it hasn't been around very long. We don't really know what it's going to do. And so there's still a little bit of, um, a little bit of uncertainty among folks. But nothing I have read or seen indicates any real um, issues with the, the cervical, uh, I mean, with the HPV vaccine. So I'm a believer. Um, 
Okay, so colorectal exam. Um, here's our little witch. She's going to go get her colorectal exam. Um, we start at age 50. Um, we stop at age 75. Again, um, family history, first degree relative, you're, you're going to come in, you're going to need to come in 10 years before that first degree relative was diagnosed. So your sister is 46. Um, you better get yours at 36, okay, if she was diagnosed with cancer at that age. Um, again, a slow-growing cancer, but extremely preventable, which is why we screen for it. Do we screen for pancreatic cancer? No, because um, it's, first of all, it's rare. Second of all, once you've got it, there's really not much to do, okay? There's a lot of things, we, cancers we don't screen for, thyroid cancer, um, uh, you know, brain cancer. You know, you don't screen for those things because they're rare, and once you've got it, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of prevention there. Um, so colonoscopy every 10 years or every two to five if they find polyps, um, which they almost always find polyps, little hyperplastic ones or, you know, the pedunculated ones or the scarier ones. Um, <clears throat> and a flexible sigmoidoscopy hardly ever done anymore. It's a terrible thing. It's straight and it's hard to use and it only, you only see the sigmoid colon. You don't, you don't see the, the right side of the, the colon. Colonoscopy goes all the way to the cecum. So it the traverses the entire length of the colon. I was fortunate in residency to get to do about 100 uh, colonoscopies. Um, and actually thought about offering them here, but that, that market's kind of sewn up. <laughs> so Plus, it, it's, a lot of, it, it's a lot of time, uh, and it's not... Um, uh, it's definitely not something you could stop in the middle of your clinic to do. But just know there are family docs out there doing colonoscopies, especially in small towns, which I think is fantastic because if there's nobody else out there to do them, I'm glad they can. Okay, prostate cancer. Um, this looks like some of, my, some of my patients. Now, I don't have that evil grin on my face when I do this. I really don't. I, li I look very friendly and they don't get scared. Um, so this is a huge area of uh, contention, fighting, screaming, um, family feuds in, uh, in academic circles. Um, when do we start testing for prostate cancer? Who do we test? Do we do a digital rectal exam, which is exactly what it sounds like, the digit and the rectum? Um, do we um, do a PSA? Do we do PSAs on non-exam years? I mean, there's infinite variety of ways to screen for prostate cancer. I tend to look at the most rigorous way uh, to screen, and that's what I, that's what I do. Um, so if you come to me and you're 40, you're probably going to get a colorectal, you're going to get a digital rectal exam every year, unless, you know, you're very low risk. Um, certainly, um, we look at things like, um, we look at things like age. Um, we look at ethnicity. African Americans tend to have a much higher rate of um, prostate cancer. We don't really know why. Um, uh, Asian Americans tend to have a lower rate. Um, we think that's due to diet. Um, diets high in um, uh, animal fats um, proteins uh, tend to increase your risk for, for colon cancer. Um, so when do we stop screening? Could be really any time. Uh, I know Dr. Sen, our, our um, uh, gastroenterologist in town, he doesn't Really do them over 75, you won't really do a screening unless it's really something obvious um, that they've got a problem, constipation or bleeding, etc. Um, between 75 and 80, we can kind of stop. If you haven't had your first colonoscopy, you're probably not going to get one. Again, because, you know, uh, it's, it, it, your life expectancy is, you know, you're getting into that area where it's probably not going to be very helpful for you um, to start with that screening. <clears throat> of course, we do a lot of diagnostic colonoscopies in that age group because those folks are the ones that start having constipation and problems and you can find the cancer there. Almost everybody that develops colon cancer late in life has not had a colonoscopy. Um, a lot of them uh, that just never, never had one and they're 85 and they're severely constipated and we go in there and there's this huge cancer. Okay, it's rare to have somebody that's go going for their colonoscopy every 10 or 5 to 10 years that suddenly develops stage four colon cancer. It happens, but it's just not very common. Um, so um, there are some there are some folks that the, the PSA. You know, if we went through the numbers of uh, how useful that test is, you guys would 
probably not ever think it was useful to get a PSA because so many things can change what a PSA. A PSA is a prostate specific antigen. It can be high in infection. It can be high just because the prostate gets uh, larger uh, over time. Um, it's higher in older men. Um, so, but I um, have personally found um, four cases of, of colon, of uh, prostate cancer in two years with my finger on an exam. Um, and uh, they got treated. So I'm a believer. <laughs> um, so when people say, well, you don't need to do that exam, I just, I have to go with what I've, what's happened to me. Um, and, and I've seen it. Um, so I wanted to end with a case study. Uh, one of my patients, um, one of my first patients here um, was a a very nice, uh, soft-spoken gentleman who came to me uh, to establish care. Uh, he was retired military, <clears throat> and he just wanted a physical. Uh, feels well, no specific complaints. He had a colonoscopy, um, which was normal at age 56. Um, no other screening tests were done. Um, he hadn't had a comprehensive physical um, he, in the past five years, so that was what he wanted me to do. So we looked at his risk factors um, because of his age. Uh, we definitely want to screen him for prostate cancer. We did a digital rectal exam and a PSA. Um, we, um, with that, that digital rectal exam is, is a two for one because you always can do a fecal occult blood test right then and there. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I don't know what I was talking about. Fecal occult blood test on non-colonoscopy years due to polyps um, on screening colonoscopy. So if you have the polyps, obviously get those every year. Um, hyperlipidemia, um, uh, we screen for this. I, I screen for it in everybody, men over 55, women over 45, um, once a year. If it's really great, we can wait a couple of years, or if their HDL is super high and they don't have any risk factor, we can wait a couple of years, but um, because of cardiovascular disease, I screen for that. Um, and then, of course, we take their blood pressure. So on Mr. Adams, his um, a uh, digital rectal exam revealed some very obvious prostate nodules, um, and uh, we got his PSA back and it was elevated. Um, I always get the lab draw first because the exam itself can elevate the PSA, so we get the nurse to come in and draw the lab and then I do the exam. So um, he was referred to um, urology. He did have prostate cancer. I don't recall uh, the stage. Um, but it was fairly advanced, um, but not so advanced that he couldn't get uh, a cure with treatment, with uh, surgery. And he's cancer free, he's doing great. So, um, I wanted to have a little bit of time for questions. Just don't ask me anything about statistics. Please ask your professors about that. <laughs> Anybody have anything burning they want to know about anything at all about how I got here or um, what I do? Oh, sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's kind of a talk in itself, but, but in a nutshell, um, I, I did my, uh, my uh, pre-doctoral uh, training at uh, the Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine in Fort Worth, which I know you guys have sent a number of students there. I think that's fantastic. Um, the difference, uh, in the early 1900s, there was a gentleman named A.T. Still. Um, he was a medical doctor, um, and he thought there had to be a better way um, besides bloodletting and all the horrid things they were doing back then uh, to treat patients. Um, he studied the musculoskeletal system in great detail, and he learned that by aligning the body um, in the musculoskeletal system, the spine, the hips, everything, you could actually promote disease. Uh, promote health and in some cases even, you know, he felt cure disease. Um, so he developed a technique um, called osteopathic uh, manipulation, which we call it now, I don't know what they called it then, um, uh, by which we um, help realign particularly the spine and the, the, the cervical and the lumbar spine um, with gentle stretching. We do some sort of chiropractic -y things like cracking and popping, but I don't really do those, I'm not very good at them. Um, and that is the only difference today uh, the only obvious difference between uh, osteopathic medicine and um, uh, allopathic medicine or MDs. Um, at TCOM, I um, got a very rigorous education. I took um, the USMLE steps one, two, and three and did fine. Um, so uh, I learned everything I, I need to learn to be an MD. But I also got um, I also got extra training in the musculoskeletal system. Um, the other difference, I think, is that um, 
at TCOM in particular, we were trained by systems. Um, we're trained to think in a, a more sort of, I hate this word, but holistic way, um, to think about the patient, um, think about a system-wide thing and how systems interconnect um, in order to make a diagnosis. So that if you come in and you know, you've got, I don't know, you've got uh, bowel problems, you've got uh, colitis, or you've got um, diarrhea or something, that we look for other things, especially if it's chronic. This is a good example. Um, especially women with chronic diarrhea, um, there's almost always a, a, a connection with depression there, um, irritable bowel syndrome. So making connections like that, of course, we're not the only ones who do that by any means, but um, uh, the training, I feel, is, is, a, is a bit more holistic. We get a little bit of um, alternative medicine, not a lot, um, but a few lectures on um, herbs and vitamins and things. Um, but other than that, it's pretty identical. Um, the way I treat, the way I practice, with the exception that I have a, a table in my office where I can um, do manipulation, um, is pretty identical. So, but I thought it was a great school. And if any of you um, have questions about TCOM in particular, I'm happy to answer those. Anybody else? Yeah. In music. Oh, good question. I was going to talk about that, and I forgot. I, uh, I have no, I don't know how that, no. Um, I, um, I, was, I was interested in, in, um, in medicine, not particularly interested in science. I was not very good in science um, in my younger years. I, um, I, I, I got good at it by just beating myself over the head with it for so long that it finally sunk in. But I was a hard worker in, in pre-med. It did not come easily. But I always had an interest in medicine. Um, after I finished my undergraduate degree, I very seriously thought about um, going back and getting some science classes and, and applying to medical school at that time. But um, I wasn't done with music yet. I wanted to see that through. Um, so I got a master's in music and I played and taught. I actually played in the Mid-Texas Symphony for a number of years. So it's kind of interesting connection. Um, and um, when I was 30, I just turned 30, um, I just thought, you know, I'm ready to do this, this is the time. Music was kind of, um, you know, it, it, it was interesting, but it was just not something I saw myself doing my whole life. Um, it was fun, but um, I thought, you know what, if I'm going to work this hard and not have any weekends off, and I think I'd like to do something that is a little bit more rewarding and will at least help me keep the lights on at home and keep myself fed. So. So I went back to uh, UT Austin where I had done my uh, master's degree um, and I started enrolling in basic sciences. I took um, calculus the first summer. Don't ever take summer calculus and don't ever take physics in the summer. It was a big mistake. Um, I think I took chemistry in the summer too. I don't know what my problem was. But um, I survived. <laughs> so, um, uh, and then just kind of one by one, I was still teaching and playing and performing and um, I would take you know three or four classes a semester. I think four is the most I ever took. Um, and after three years, I finally had all my prereqs. I took the MCAT. There you go. So. Anybody else? No. I don't want to make you guys late for your next um, uh, lecture, but thank you so much. Um, I, I have had um, TLU students uh, shadow me, and I'm, I'm happy to do that. So um, uh, let, let one of your professors know if you're, if you're a pre-med and you're interested in doing that. I'd be happy to have you at my clinic. Thank you. Students at TLU engage in high-impact educational experiences that include civic engagement, aesthetic expression, critical thinking, and a focus on intercultural knowledge in a community that welcomes the interplay of faith and reason.